and welcome to Let's Go Speaks. Today is, I have no idea what day it is. It's almost November though. <laughs> it's the Tuesday before Halloween. And this is episode 250 something. Hey, I'm Amy Beth, also known as the Fat Squirrel on Ravelry and the Fat SQRRL on Instagram. And as I'm sure you figured out, I'm your hostess. How are you? Are you doing well? We're having very deliciously cloudy autumn times right now. So I'm in this, I'm in a different place. Um, and sometimes I will fluctuate between my front room and then this is which is basically my dining room. I'm looking at my kitchen. I'm looking at my living room. I'm looking at the front room where I normally record. Uh, but as winter starts to happen and sun patterns change, sometimes I will move into here, um, especially on days like this where it's very cloudy. We just can't seem to get much sunlight. No, Gus, no. <sighs> anyway, I am drinking hot apple cider. Mm, I'm living the life. I'm usually not a fruit juice drinker at all, but I do make an exception every year with one gallon of hot apple cider, well, of apple cider. I have had those like little Mulling spices in a tea bag before, which I really love, but I don't have any this year. So I gotta find some of those. Actually, I don't because I'm already two cups into this gallon. So by the time they would get here, it'd be a moot point. Okay, maybe I'll just throw a cinnamon stick in there next time. I won't even lie, I did try one cup with just like a chai tea bag. <laughs> so I was like, but spices. It wasn't bad, I'm not gonna lie. It was a little bit interesting. It had a slight bitterness to it because of the tea, but I don't even know that that was a bad thing. I think, I think I know you're gonna judge me. I'm from Ohio, yo, and I live in Indiana. Judge away. I'm flipping like food progressive for this area. <laughs> um, but I so said, I know you're gonna judge me, but I would try it again. I like them apples. Oh! So, this week's episode will contain. There are no fun shenanigans. Okay, there are fun shenanigans. There are no outdoor shenanigans. <laughs> but we're doing some food shenanigans. So, I'm going to do some of that. And then I'll have, of course, knitting. I don't have any spinning. I'm right now I'm looking at the Halloween puzzle that's on my uh, dining room table, which is almost done. So I've been enjoying doing that. I'm not gonna lie. I am not even good at puzzles. Like, I'm, I don't feel like I'm very good at jigsaw puzzles. They take me quite a bit of time and I won't even lie to you. If you give me a 500 piece or a thousand piece, I might choose the 500 piece because, well, it's a shorter time window that I can get that done in. But I do really enjoy them, even though I'm not particularly good at them. So, yay, puzzles. Oh, that was just to say, like, I've been doing that in my free time a lot because it's enjoyable. Um, so, yeah. Oh, and then I'll do some shameless self-promotion at the end. Now, the shameless self-promotion at the end will just be the same things I showed you last time, uh, but I have another, well, because I, I showed you last time a preview for the November 1st update. So I will do that again in case you missed it. Um, so I will do that at the end. And I think, yeah, that's it. So let's do kitchen shenanigans. I feel like there was something else. Oh, a lot of people last time I talked about the spoon trick for mosquito bites. And I know this is like wicked helpful for you now that it's almost November. Yeah, that spoon trick literally works y'all. I get eaten alive by mosquitoes all the time. And I have big reactions. Now I would not say that I am allergic to them, but I do get like pretty big bites. And in fact, the little German pen that I told you about last time, <laughs> it doesn't always work for me because the surface area that it burns is a really small one, which is great for I think a lot of people, but for me, for some reason, I don't know. I don't know. I don't look at other people's mosquito bites, so maybe mine are totally normal, but I think they get a little bit poofier. Anyway, Gus, 
have squashes here to show you, and he's chewing on the stems. Gus, really, buddy, I love you. I totally gave you a fancy treat earlier, and you just hit it and didn't chew it. But you want to chew this dirty squash stem. Anyway. <laughs> and the pen I had in my pocket that he took out of my pocket. Anyway. So, you can either heat a spoon up, like if you're out and about and you happen to have a fire apparatus available, um, like if you're camping or something, you can either heat a spoon up with a, 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 a fire apparatus, or what I do is usually boil a kettle of water, pour the hot water in a cup, and then put the spoon in there because I can like take it to another location if I need to, like if I need to like contort myself in a weird way. Um, but you just put the spoon in the hot water so the spoon is hot and then you just touch it onto the mosquito bite. Now, you're gonna touch it, it's gonna be too hot, okay? Don't be super tough person, okay? If you can't stand it, take it off because it's it will burn you. I did burn my husband when I did it to his hand once because he was being too tough. But anyway, so don't be too tough. So you just take it, you just put it on your mosquito bite as, and just hold it there until it cools off and it totally works to get the, to get the itchy out. Okay. It legit works, y'all. So there you go. Ding! The more you know. Um, I think that was all from the mailbag, mostly. I think so. So let's get into it. Oh, I am wearing a hitchhiker, which is a part a pattern by Martina Bem, and it's knit with hand spun, fiber dyed by Hello Yarn. It's one of her, yeah, it was one of those like patchwork kits, which are just like all of her bits and bobs left over. Um, and so yeah, it's totally cool enough to wear knitwear. Love it. So you can see the little... So this is not fingering weight. I actually really love... Um, this is probably like a sport, maybe even a DK. And I really love the Hitchhiker in this fatter yarn. Because I like garter to tighter gauge, I guess. And so to do that on regular fingering weight yarn is too tedious. Might as well just be making a sweater. You know what I mean? Okay. So let's talk about squash and apples. Okay, so first off, if you're new to the show, I really like apples in a slightly crazy way. Yeah, the orchard picking is like really... I don't want to say that it's like a happier than Rhinebeck experience because it's not, but it's like a, a Rhinebeck experience like condensed into like the hour that I'm at the orchard. So there is actually maybe more pure joy experience for me in the orchard per unit of time I am spent there. Um, so I dig it. Yay. By the way, just as an aside, Thanks to all the podcasters in the universe who are brilliant and do vlogs at Rhinebeck. It is so helpful when you are having, well, it's helpful for me. So I know some people when they are missing out on something don't want to see anything about it because it just like, it just makes them feel more intensely sad about not being there. I really loved it. It was great. I've enjoyed so many of them so far. And I'm looking forward to watching another one today while I get back to work this afternoon. But anyway. This is a new to me apple. I have been enjoying Jonna Golds. We did not, we've not picked as many apples as we usually do. We've only done one picking trip. I don't even know what's going on with us. Sorry, that's a phone thing. Um, so we've only gone with the orchard once, but we've, to picking once, but we have purchased some apples from the orchard. And usually I'm not a big Jonna Gold person, but this year I've been really digging the Jonna Golds what that's about. They're a slightly sweeter apple than I normally like. Um, they have a tendency to go slightly grainy if you don't store them well. I do store them in the refrigerator because um, they get a little, they are a softer apple. They're not super soft. They're not like a Fuji or a Gala, but they're also not super firm. So if the apple's like that, I usually store it in the refrigerator. Actually, quite frankly, I store all the apples in the refrigerator as long as I have space, which is not always the case. I'm not kidding you. I, every year I'm like, we need an apple refrigerator for the basement. That seems reasonable, right? Except then I would end up with like 60 pounds of apples in that refrigerator every year. Let's not even pretend. 160 pounds of apples in that refrigerator every year. Out of control. 
But this is a new to me apple. <laughs> These I got at Whole Foods. They are Organic Lady Alice apples. And apparently this is a chance hybrid. So this was not a planned apple. It was just like in the many seeds that were planted or that planted themselves, this apple arose. And it's quite tasty. Have you had this one? So if you're keeping up with apples in America, and I'm sure other places too, um, people are out of their minds about the honey crisp. Like people can't stop. They're mark I don't know if it's the marketing campaign, if it's just it's like because quite frankly, apples have had a very bad rap in our country for a very long time because the forefront, like the fr like the, every apple that you see, like as the picture of an apple, like the iconic image of an apple is in fact a red delicious apple and we all know somebody's going to fight me, but you can fight me on this. I will win. Um they're awful. I will say this. I have had a Red Delicious from our orchard and it was totally acceptable. So I don't even know how that works because they're genetically the same apple. But again, like everything else, environmental factors factor in. But anyway, neither here nor there. So I feel like American apples, like apples have gotten a really rad, bad rap because that's the apple you get like as a kid. That's the apple you get in like a packed lunch. That's like the apple o America. And it's, why did they pick that as the representative? It's a terrible apple. So I don't know, I can't figure out the honey crisp. I mean, I, I, I'm, I would not turn down a honey crisp apple, but I don't ever buy them. It's possible I've just got a few that were kind of lackluster, but, or they're just not my jam, right? Like I like a tart apple, I like a very firm apple, and so they're just not my jam. Uh, but anyway, neither, people love them, crazy for them. Pay two ninety nine a pound for them. Actually, more than that even sometimes. Anyway, but apparently they're quite difficult for folks to grow. They're not the easiest apple to grow. Um, so the apple agricultural community has been trying to market other apples that are have a similar flavor texture profile but are perhaps a little bit heartier or more whatever, they're easier to grow. Okay. Okay. So this is one of those apples that is um, kind of um, pushed as a comparison to a honey crisp. Um, I know a lot of you are excited about the cosmic crisp that's coming out in December. I'm not going to fight you for that apple, but I do want to hear all about it. And I will buy one if we have one around. But have you heard about the cosmic crisp? By the way, I love that my Instagram post where I posted the picture of the apple got so much discussion. That's so enjoyable, y'all. I can't even tell you about it. But anyway, <laughs> back to this one. <laughs> I did enjoy this apple. No, it is sweeter. It's definitely sweeter than my normal apple preference. It's very juicy. And it has a nice firm texture. It's not a hard texture like a pink, like exact, it's not as firm as like a pink lady. Like sometimes a pink lady will cut your gum. Like she is not playing. This one was definitely softer than that, but much more firm than like a Gala or a Fuji than, than I typically would experience with those apples. Um, firmer than like a Golden Delicious. So very juicy, very sweet, but interestingly enough, I felt like had Usually I can kind of like parse out what the flavors in an apple are. Like I go, oh, that kind of has like a floral thing going on. I'm not a sommelier, but I do like apples. So like, you know, usually you can kind of name like what, like this one is kind of grassy. This one is kind of, this one I don't, I can't figure it out. It's a little bit grassy. Like it has a slight something like it, but it's, it's, uh, I can't put my finger on what this apple actually tastes like other than the sweet part of it. Um, so I'm going to keep eating them because mostly I'm just like, what is this? <laughs> that might put some of you off, but I don't, I hope it doesn't because it's, it's a, I really, I would totally buy these again. They were very enjoyable. Um, and they do say that they hold, I did not bake with them, but they do say that they hold up 
similar to like a Grady's Smith or something like a baking apple. So it should be good for a pie or what have you. I would not use them exclusively though, um, unless you were you cut maybe back on your sugar because they are pretty darn sweet. Uh, but I did enjoy them. Very enjoyable. So again, those were called Lady Alice. Yeah. I've only seen them at Whole Foods. I haven't seen them anywhere else. Let's talk about some squash. Oh my gosh, it's winter squash season. It's so exciting. So not only is it exciting this winter squash season, but because I'm going to have a surgery in November, Sorry, the dog just distracted me with how crazily he's laying. What is up with this weird dog? <sighs> anyway. So I've been trying to like cook ahead some for myself. Um, my family's pretty much like, they are not food driven. <laughs> like really, like they are, would totally be fine just eating like ramen and pizza, I think forever. Like me feeding them is an act of love for them to try to make sure that, you know, their body is doesn't like explode from sodium caffeine content consumption so I've been cooking ahead for family but like they can also just take care of themselves like my kiddo is 12 almost 13 my husband is a grown-up like they can take care of themselves but I am trying to so I have I have cooked a little bit like a few things like prepped or cooked or whatever and frozen for them but a lot of it is just for me <laughs> because I'm not going anywhere for a few weeks. And hi, my body needs to repair itself, so I have to take good care of it. So I have a lot of sleeping and eating of good food in my healing process mapped in. I'm telling you guys, don't stress your bodies out. Take care of them. But because that has coincided with winter squash season, I have an excuse to make all of the spicy, delicious winter squash things that I want to eat. I mean, I do anyway, but. <laughs> I mean, quite frankly, I do anyway, but it's even more exciting now, yay. So I just want to talk, cause a couple of people have asked me like what I do with squash. Okay, I am not a food expert in any way, but I do like to eat. So I will tell you what I do with things. Okay, so first of all, butternut squash. I love butternut squash. Um, so I have used those already this season. I make up, there's this thing I love that's kind of, it's like comfort foodie, okay? So just judge, but don't, okay? So I do black beans, brown rice, and then I make a filling, like a like binding agent. I'll roast butternut squash and then do like me the peppers and onions or just onions sometimes and um, a little bit of cheese. So the beautiful thing about roasted or butternut squash is that it like, there's a reason there's like butternut squash bisque. Like it purees into this like very lovely silky binding agent. So it's really nice for that because I make like this kind of like burrito-y taco-y filling out of it. And so... What I did is I just combined my black beans, my brown rice, and I make a very spicy, squashy, sometimes chard, sometimes chicken, sometimes kale, whatever you got going. You can even do it with beef or lamb or something. Maybe not lamb. Yeah, whatever. Do what you want to do. But anyway, so you just do that. And then, like, I either just put it in, like, freezer bags, like, just as a filling, like, flat freeze them. And then like, that is the most delicious treat. It's a little bit sweet because of the butternut, but it's spicy because of the taco mm. And by spicy, I mean like a, like a taco seasoning. You could even use like, this time I totally used like, um, Pinzi's chicken taco seasoning as part of it. So I put in some lime with it too. So it had like a little acidity, but then the sweetness and then the black beans are all groundy. It's like, oh, So you can either like put it in like a tortilla wrapper and freeze it like that so it's like ready to go or you can just put it in there loose in a filling if you typically have something that you know that you would eat with it about it's so good i don't have a recipe sorry but just do that make it good <laughs> i 
And so that points to one of the things that I typically do with squash because I don't feel like I have like a, like maybe like a family history. Like my family is not eating squash. Um, probably my grandparents definitely would, but like I don't ever remember having like prepared squashes at meals or anything like that. Um, so I feel like maybe because of that, I don't have like a real deep understanding of how to cook with. I typically just roast it and then add it into things because I don't want it to get too smooshy. Now, like, and I said in the, in that burrito filling that I do, usually what I do is we'll add a little bit into like some tomatoes and onions stuff to cook that down. So it gets a little bit smooshy, but then I'll add in the chunks of the squash so that they still remain intact. Okay. So I usually, that's usually what I do. Like butternut squash, I peel, I chop up, I roast. And I do that with these. So I apologize, I'm probably gonna say this incorrectly. And I always wanna call it a kombucha squash, but it's a kaboka squash. And it's a Japanese, or maybe it's kabocha. It's a Japanese pumpkin. This is the one and only one that I grew this year. <laughs> I had like three plants. This is the store one, this is mine. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure she even got totally ripe, but I had to cut her down because her plant got sick. So I had to see. So we'll just see if she does okay. But I really like this squash. It is, like I said, it's a Japanese pumpkin, but it's like, um, it's not as sweet as a butternut. It's definitely like a nuttier, and I think even like a firmer squash. I really love it. But same thing, like cut it up. You can either peel it or not. It's totally up to you. Um, usually it's thin enough, the, the rind that you can eat. Now, this one I probably will peel because it's got a lot of like little wortiness on it and I don't know how that would do. Um, but like this one, I probably won't. So it's just up to you. But all I do is peel it. This one, it's easier to cut if you like cut off the top and cut off the butt. Uh, if you're not peeling it because then your knife can kind of bite into the softer flesh and it gets it a little bit more purchase before you have to like lean on it with all of your body to cut it. <laughs> Some people totally microwave their squashes to get them either soft enough than to roast or just to cook them that way. It's totally your jam. I just kind of enjoy butchering giant squashes. It's, I just kind of enjoy it. It's fun. Um, so <laughs> what I do is like cut your, cut off the stem and the flower end, and then I'll cut it in half, take all the seeds out, and then just cut it into slices, like pie. And then usually I put some sort of fat on it, so like olive oil and some seasoning, so you can either just use salt and pepper, or usually I'm gonna just use something that's similar to what I'm cooking with. So like a cumin, or if I want it to be even spicier, you know, a, a pepper or something like that. Or you can use like a Penzi spice blend that's gonna match with whatever you're making. Or you can just totally make it vanilla and then you can add it into anything. Uh, one of the great things is you can just like roast these up, put them in the fridge and then just add them in. If you're like me and you live in a family of people who hate vegetables, you can just add them into your thing so they're already cooked. You just add them into your portion of whatever it is, like your chili or whatever. Your, you can make them squash not, nachos, whatever. You can add it into anything and it's already prepped and good for you. So yeah. So that one is that one. I made like, um, I've not cooked with it this year, but last year, this was a new to me squash last year. And I made like, um, kind of like a Moroccan it, spiced with the kabuk, the kaboka, the kabocha and adzuki beans. And that was really tasty. Usually I just make everything like a slightly stew like texture and then eat it with something else <laughs> like rice or just like as a stew with some bread or something. I'm super fancy y'all. But anyway, super enjoyable. And then you have these little fancy gals, these delicatas. Have you seen these yet? These are delicious if you like a sweet swash. A sweet swash? A sweet swash. They are, I don't know that they're sweeter than butternut. These butternuts I got last time were like mega sweet. So I don't know that they're necessarily sweeter than a butternut, but a lot of people like them because they are easier to handle. You don't have to peel them. You can definitely eat this rind. It's super thin. Um, and again, it's a much smaller dude. So you can even just like cut them up like little rings and just lay them on a sheet pan and roast them. 
um, whatever. That's what I do with this one just because it's kind of, it's really like the same price. I think they're all about the same price per pound. But I don't know, it's delicata. You gotta treat it delicata -ly. She's a delicious squash and I enjoy her very much. And she's nice and cool and I'm all flushed, so that's a good thing. And then, I don't know if you'll see these in the grocery store, but they are pretty exciting. So this is from my garden. I was introduced to the squash by Saw Wet Farm, which is also Knit Spin Farm and crew. Um, they gave me one of theirs last year and so I had to grow some this year. This is my most successful one. She's very pretty. And I have two tiny ones. <laughs> but these are either called like Sweet Georgia Candy Roasters or just Candy Roasters, whatever. They're another one that has a fairly edible rind. It's, I would, now in terms of keeping, I would not trust this or the Delicata to keep as long. Like I have totally had butternut squash in my pantry for like, do I even want to admit? Probably like three months before I've been fine. <laughs> as long as you keep them dry, cool, and well ventilated, they'll last a long time. Hi, that's like why we grew them is because we could store them in a reseller. Um, and like this dude, he feels like he could really hang out in a root cellar. Like he is sturdy. Um, but these guys I would eat up fairly soon after I got them. I don't know. I've not tried to keep them long. They're also just so delicious. You just want to eat them up right away. And I would say the same as, I don't know. This one is to me the same thing. I'll probably eat this relatively soon. Uh, but again, same thing. Just slice it up, seed it out, roast it, put it in a chili, whatever you want to do with it. It's delicious. I always like them with spicy things because they are sweet and I'm not generally a sweet vegetable person. Like I don't really love just like a sweet potato roasted. Sorry. Um, I'm not a sweet vegetable person, but I do love them in spicy stuff because they just are like, Ooh, it's like a little present when you bite into that part. Delicious. So like in curries or again, like Moroccan flavors or delicious spicy Mexican flavors. They are so good to me. But anyway, so yeah, just turn your oven on to 400, cut that thing up, put a little oil on it, put some seasonings on it, roast it till it's your taste. Usually I start, if it's little pieces, I start at like a 20 minute mark. If it's big chunks, like 30, and then just kind of test with a fork every once in a while. And then tell Alexa to make another seven minute timer and then check it in seven to 10 minutes. And you know, that's how you just do it. Should we talk about knitting now? <laughs> that sounds silly. <laughs> so I have an almost finished knitting project. Object. What are these words I say? I don't know. This is my yoke Emma sweater. So it's done, but I haven't blocked it because I'm such a nerd. Um, and this is knit with Pat Juniper Moon Farms Patagonia. And we had the discussion last time of whether this was pink or red. I know that it's not like pink, pink. Some of you were like, well, it's more of a beat. I was like, I know, I know that. <laughs> but I did inform my husband that the internet told him he was very wrong about things. Okay. Okay. So anyway, so here it is. It's all done. It's long sleeve. I did have to go to the pink. Actually, I think it's called thistle. Um, I did do my cuffs in a slightly contrasting color because I ran out of main color yarn. <sighs> I would have had enough had Gus not stolen one of the balls. I had to rip out my hem because my hem was like just a little bit too long. So I ripped out one of my hems. I thought, oh, I have an extra, I have enough yarn. I could probably finish the sleeves. And then he tangled it up in a way that I just wasn't able to deal with. <laughs> I just had to let it go. Um, but I kind of like to have a little fun pop of the pink on the sleeves. Anyway, I don't have a lot of pink stuff, so it just seemed kind of fun. So yeah, I will get that blocked and then we'll talk more about it last time. But I really, so far, really like this yarn and I'm really loving the crop sweaters. I have been wearing my Ducat by Kate Davies in the, um, which I did make shorter than was suggested. In 
Harrisville Designs nightshades and I have been wearing that with like one of my painted portrait dresses which is like a house dressy kind of smocky thing. I've been wearing the pants out of that. If you see me opening live I'll probably wearing it then because I just really am digging the short sweaters with the house dresses. My favorite! So anyway, so I'm excited to get this one into the rotation, although I'm not sure which house dress it's gonna go with. I might have to make a new house dress. That seems reasonable. I know it's totally insane. <laughs> As a woman with a 56 inch bust, I can't believe I'm saying, believe I'm saying this out loud. <sighs> so as part of my Weinbeck experience, I totally bought this book, Shetland by Marie Wallen from um, The Woolly Thistle. <sighs> so dreamy. And I'm like, do I need a full color work cardigan? Maybe I do. Or maybe I just need that one that's like purple at the bottom and beautiful rose colors at the top. Or do I just want to go full bore? By the way, this pattern book is not sized to my size, but whatever. I have feelings, but I'm just gonna... <laughs> Sometimes I'm weak. And I buy the thing that's not sized to my size, even though I really shouldn't. Like, look at that nonsense. And then Sarah Promigrant was wearing hers at Rhinebeck, and I saw pictures of her. She looks so gorgeous in it. And then I saw on Books and Cables, she did a, a Rhinebeck, and they were, one of her friends was wearing the one that's purple at the bottom, and it was gorgeous. Why can't I find the one that's purple at the bottom? There we go. <laughs> Why can't I work this book? What's wrong with me? <laughs> there we go. That one. <sighs> really though? Lunatic. Lunatic! Okay, but let's talk about some other knitting. Okay, that's my only finished object. I have a very close, almost finished object. And it is insane. Where did I put my... I did, oh there it is, okay, so like I did write down everything and then now I can't find the book. I found it. So this is the Cozy Ski Mask by Veronica or Veron Veronique Legault. Anyway, I'll put it in the show notes because Ohio Indian, I'm sorry. Um, Cozy Ski Mask, it's written for an Aaron weight, but I had um, a heavy fisherman's weight by uh, beaver slide dry goods so I had that in stash and my husband works outside and we are coming up on the outside times of winter sorry and so he did ask for actually I don't think he asked for it I think I offered for a ski mask balaclava whatever with just his little eyeballs so I'm almost done um this yarn I really do love this yarn Beaver Slide Dry Goods is a woolen spun yarn. This is their three ply. It's a little bit heavier than I would normally, like I would not want to knit a sweater with it. Um, just because it does border on like that bulky um, gauge and it, it's not the easiest on my hands. That said, and I'm knitting it at kind of a tight gauge obviously for this hat thing. But that said, I do really enjoy it and I think it's gonna be very warm and toasty. Um, because I did not want to knit with a superwash. I wanted to knit with a non-superwash yarn. Sorry, we're getting more backlighting because the sun has changed. Of course it has. Um, but so anyway, so I needed more than one skein though. Um, so this, the pattern originally was cast on here and worked up. Um, and I thought, when I was like, oh, I might need to, I had another color that was like a, I don't know what I made with this, but it was in stash, it was just a leftover ball. This is the, I think it's called Autumn Licorice, and then this is a blue, I don't know, it's blue people. Um, so I thought, oh, I'll put in a few stripes to kind of help me. 
So then I got up to here and had to use, like, do you care if there's a polka dot on the top of your head? He's like, I literally don't. I'm like, okay, good. So then he tried it on and it hit him like right at the Adam's apple. So he is a tall dude and has kind of a tall head. He does a long face. So um, I was totally out of the blue and I said, do you mind if it's orange? She's like, again, don't care. So I just, um, I did pick out the cast on just because I was afraid since it's a bulkier yarn that it might be sort of abrasive. Um, so I picked out the cast on but then just picked up and then I'm working another inch and a half or two inches in the licorice. Now you can definitely see it's not perfect looking like but you know if you don't if your person's not a knitter they're not going to care. <laughs> So when you pick up from the other direction, your stitches are usually off half a stitch. Um, not usually, they are off half a stitch. So when you have ribbing, like when you're doing stockinette, you don't notice it. But when you have ribbing, it's it definitely makes like a, like a little, whoop, what happened there? But again, it doesn't really matter in this case at all. Yeah, so I'm almost done. I just need to work the bind off and then block it and everything. So there's that. And then I cast on a hat for him. This is some ancient hand spun. I don't think the dyer even dyes anymore. I couldn't give you, I could not tell you who it was if you gave me money. But this is some of my very early hand spun and I love this color combination so much. I want to say that it was like Van Gogh inspired and it took forever, like it was like a pre-order and it took forever to get it. But I love it so much. So I think I had knit myself like a, just like a ribbed hat with it, stocking hat before and I did not, like I just didn't like how the hat fit. So this yarn is probably like six years old. Um, but I just love the like tealy, oceany green and this like great rust. I don't know. There's something about it that I just, it just does it for me. I love it. I'm just going to show it to you a whole bunch to tell you that I really do like it. <laughs> so if you dye fiber and you dye this, let me know. <laughs> if you're going to dye something similar because I love it. Anyway, so he's usually notoriously a pain to knit a hat for. <laughs> my battery, my car battery went dead this week, my own fault. Um, and he charged it and took care of it all for me. Like there are lots of wonderful things about him. He's a pain to knit a hat for. He traditionally does not like a hat to touch his ears. It's difficult to get a hat that will stay, but he doesn't want it to move around. So it needs to stay on his head, not touch his ear. It's like, that's a that's actually a kind of a challenge. So usually what I end up doing is knitting a hat that has a sideways brim and then just like flat, like a little flat top almost. Cause it's, you know, by the time you get any width on a brim, you're already up to like your crown decreases. Gus, don't you touch this yarn. I'm, I just dropped the ball. He's asleep now. Anyway, <laughs> so he's so difficult to knit a hat for, but for some reason, and traditionally it was because he used to wear glasses and I understand like lots of times a hat that covers your ears will push down on your glasses and it can get uncomfortable. Um, especially if you're wearing like a heavier hat because you're working outside, but he has since gotten the eye surgery, zoom, zoom, bam, bam. And he doesn't need, he could just needs reading glasses, which he doesn't always wear when he's outside working. So I don't know what happened, but he was like, ex he was willing to think that maybe he would accept a hat that did cover his ears. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> but interestingly, he picked a fun one. He does like a fancy, like he likes an unusual hat. And I think he kind of enjoys that, like the people at his work comment on his hats quite a bit because he wears like, the leather wide brim hats and 
people frequently ask him if he's Mennonite, which is ridiculous because whatever, people are crazy. Um, but so he, I showed him this one, which is the Cornice by Wooly Wormhead. And he does, I said, now yeah, not the, not the pom pom. The pom pom might be a bridge too far. And he was like, I don't think I want a pom pom. I was like, dude, I just said that. So, but he really enjoyed the shaping of the hat. He like really thought it was, he's like, it's like a helmet. I was like, yes, it kind of is. <laughs> anyway, so he's really into it. And originally I picked out a solid colored yarn, but I thought, I think that he likes that you can see the shaping of it. And I was afraid you wouldn't be able to tell necessarily in a solid color. So I decided to cast it on with this precious hand sponge. So I have this much, which is not very much. I just did it last night, but I have discovered that my, um, I think the pattern is written for a DK and this is probably worsted. So my gauge is a little bit too big. It's five stitches to the inch instead of six. So I'm going to just take it apart and cast on fewer stitches. But I'm excited about more. Also, if you are a person who beat yourself up about mistakes, just so you know, I totally cast this on. How many hats have I cast on in my life? A gajillion. Who twisted the rip? Who twisted the cast on? And didn't notice it literally to like a row ago. I did this crazy thing though, which don't, don't, don't hold me to it, okay? I did this crazy thing that kind of worked. I went like one stitch before the beginning of the row. Now I only, I actually did two stitches before the beginning of the row. Now I only did that because I was actually gonna do it at the beginning of the row, but I'm knitting garter in the round, which means I'm wrapping and like I'm wrapping and then flipping my hat inside out essentially and knitting the pearl side, like the pearl bumps. So I have like some wraps and turns on that, the, the stitch on either side of the beginning marker. So, I went like two stitches back and I like just dropped the stitch down to like, till like there was just the cast on and maybe one stitch. I think I couldn't get it any lower than that. And I just untwisted it. So it did twist it. Like there is a bit of a bump. Like you can see it right there. That's where I did it right there. Wow. So like there is a bit of a bump where you, you would know as like, a fancy knitter, something was maybe not right there, but I was totally gonna get away with it. Look at that. So I just like dropped it down, twisted it, and then kind of just like did like, just kind of like picked up a couple, um, you know, a couple of the loops. <laughs> the rows, sorry, just like a couple of those. I didn't pick up the full amount of rows because it was, because I had twisted it, or untwisted it essentially, but twisted it. Um, it was firm and so I didn't want to try to pick them all up. So I just picked up about half of them. I'm just saying, if I didn't have to take this apart to make it a smaller size, I would have definitely just left it that way. But I have to take it apart because I realize it's going to be too big. <laughs> Which I don't mind doing because it's hand spun. Yay! Okay. So then what else do I have? I did work a little bit more on my Foolproof, which is a pattern by Louise Zass Bangham. And mine is knit with hand spun. One ply is um, batlings from, or bats from Knit Spin Farm. And the other ply is Tunis from fiber that I got from Tar Heel Billy Farm, who is speaking and has been at YouTube, at YouTube. <laughs> at Vogue Knitting Live. I don't know what you do. In Columbus, Ohio, this weekend. So yeah, I'm totally gonna go see her, her talk. I'm so excited. It would've been really nice if I'd have gotten this done and like worn it, but you know, whatever. I was at a, um, 
what's that called? A housewarming party and knit a good little piece on it. So that was exciting. Yay. And there's my super cute apple cider donut stitch marker from Melia Bella. I keep hiding my fingernails because I'm not sure that they look at all presentable. Not that my fingernails ever look presentable, but sometimes they're just also dirty. <laughs> I'm a human being and stuff. Okay, so there's that. And then also, I got some more work done on my Trelawney shawl. And this is a pattern by Tyne Swedish. She has another one out. She's doing like a whole Harry Potter series of shawls. Are you excited? Of course you are. So she's got another one out that is um, a crescent. I'm like, what's the shape, people? Thank you. It's a crescent. <laughs> she's working on a few more. I'm very excited. So here's mine so far. Oh, why did I stop in the middle of the row? I'm such a nerd. Hmm. <sighs> Sorry, kids. Isn't that looking lovely? So my garter stitch is Madeline Tosh Shock in the Wicked colorway. And then the Beautiful Variegated is a silk blend from another crafty girl in a fraggle rock colorway called the all-knowing from the trash heap okay you're just looking so lovely so this is a great tv knitting social knitting um thinking about the state of the world knitting project and i'm really enjoying it it's a triangular shawl and it's very enjoyable so yay, her puppers just passed away. And I really felt for her because um, this time last year is when we lost Olive. When we put Olive to sleep, I shouldn't use euphemisms. Um, and so I've really been feeling for her. So, so if you were interested in any of her designs, go buy some. Mm -hmm. She's local to me. Okay, and then Okay, then the only other thing I have to show you is I didn't make a ton of progress. Okay, I made very little progress. But I am knitting on, oopsie. Oh, come on me. Oh, there we go. I can, oh. I don't have the title page printed. Really? Yorkville. Oh my goodness. The Yorkville sweater by Mina Phillip, who is Knitting Expat. She has a podcast of Knitting Expat, Expat Designs. And I am knitting this out of Peace Fleece DK in the Shaplova Mushroom colorway. And I do have a little bit more knit. Back. It's very pleasant. I've just been like, oh, I should work on my shawl. Oh, I should work on this. Oh, I should work on these socks. You know how to, oh, I need to make a giant ski mask for my husband. That's probably slowed me down quite a bit because that's a lot of me being like, I should knit on that and I get it out. And then I'm like, I don't even want to knit on this. <laughs> so then I end up not knitting. But anyway, so here's my, it's the back so far. I love this yarn. I'm enjoying the design. I'm excited to have it. I think it's going to be super wearable. Get my fires going, y'all. I've also been doing a lot of daydream knitting. Right back. Right back is the worst. And then I've been wanting to knit one of those like DK Colorwork sweaters. So, um, Soldatna. But then there's been this other one that's super cute. What is that one called? And so I thought, no, I'm going to knit that, then this other one because it had like more of a stripey feel to it. So this was the other one was the Bravura Pullover by Beatrice Perrin Dolan of Thread and Ladle. So that, have you seen this one? Oh my 
to get this universe. Come on. There we go. And I don't know if you can tell from the picture, but the purple sleeve is a knit sleeve. It's not a short sleeve sweater. So I was like, oh, I think I want to knit that one. And then I was like, so I was just like going back and forth. Because you can get, you can use more single skeins with this one in my size. I think you can use single skeins for the Soldatna in smaller sizes, but for my size, you need two skeins of two different colors. Um, so this one, you have a little bit, you need more of that purple color, that main, that the sleeve is, but A, you could just continue the pattern and not worry about it. Or B, you can, it's a little bit easier to mix up because it's the same, you know, um, graphic throughout. So I was like, oh, that's the right way to go. That's what I need to do. And so then I get everything out and plan that one. And then I think though what I'm actually gonna do, daydream knitting. I found a very wicked thing, y'all. I don't know how, why I found it. I think somebody had posted on Instagram like a stripe pattern that had been done digitally and I was like, how did they do that? And so I Googled like random stripe generators and there's the thing. You probably know about it, but not everybody does. I checked it. I checked not everybody knows about it. <laughs> There's a random stripe generator on biscuits and jam, and it's pretty rad, okay? You can either do random stripe generator, or you can do, um, if you wanna like control the white, the stripe, the width of the stripe, but you want randomly placed stripes, then there's also the original random stripe generator. Um, but there's a weighted one where it's, The random, the original one, you can either control, you can control like the stripe widths. You can say, I only want them to be four rows or I only want them to be two rows or I want them between two and five rows. This one doesn't do that. But like if you have two skeins of something, but only one skein of other thing, you can put that in so you'll get twice as many Let's say if you have two skeins of blue and one skein of purple, it'll give you twice as many blue stripes as purple stripes. Does that make sense? Anyway, they're both there and you can play with them. And so I'm going to just stop you for just one second and then I'm going to put one in and to show you what it does. Okay. Okay. So I did one for you. So this one I just did. So this is sort of similar to the stripe colors I was looking at. So you're like, oh, that's cool. And you're like, but I don't know if I really love that one. If you just hit reload it'll give you a different stripe pattern I'm not even kidding you how fun is that and she's got it all written out there for you so I may have spent a little too much time doing that <laughs> all the ways I didn't use my wine dark time the most effectively that's what I did Okay, so then let's do random shameless self-promotion. Sorry, it's not random. Let's just do shameless self-promotion. If you're like, dude, I already saw those bags. I feel you. If you're like, dude, I'm not interested in buying your bags. Right on. I won't say anything more exciting. This will be the end. Um, if you are bummed that you didn't get one of those awesome kitty cats and house coats packs, the last update, because boy, they went fast. Ninja. Y'all ninja it. Um... If you did not get one and you really want one, I am going to do a pre-order for those December 1st at 9 a.m. Eastern time. So usually I do p.m., but I'll do 9 a.m. just to kind of mix up a bit. It will be sewn to order. And they, I will, sh I have strong intentions of shipping them on December 16th so that they have a week to get there before you get Christmas time if you want to use them as Christmas gifts <clears throat> or just a gift to yourself because hi hello who else is going to get you a cat and house coat bag get it for yourself, yo. um so I'm going to do that December 1st now that I will try to do as many listings as I can um I will be recovering still during that period so I'm not gonna obviously not going to like go crazy. So I, I, I plan, I will try to limit the listings so that I can get them out in that two week period. That's my intention. And then, okay, so that's that. 
And then I'm also having an update December, November 1st. November 1st at 9 p.m. Eastern, and that will be the last update probably of the year. I don't know, but probably, other than the, the pre-order one. We'll see. That seems like crazy, but probably not. <laughs> so here's what's gonna be in that update. There are still some poinsettia bags in the shop, so if you're interested in those, they are linen and cotton blend, and they are a shawl sweater, or excuse me, a shawl size, just large wedge. All the bags I'm showing you today have a unbleached cotton lining. So there's that. And the new to this update are gonna be these sweet deers. Sweet deers! Aren't they cute? So this is also linen cotton blend. Canvasy linen cotton. And then sweater size. What? The sweet woodland scenes, yo. With the awesome scrummy green. I love it so much. Especially with those jewel tones. It just really, ah, oh, love that green in there. And then. This is canvas, this is canvas. These sweet red and teal birds. And look at the mushrooms, yo. Look at the mushrooms. Birds and mushrooms, I'm 100% in, right? So fun. So cute. And then Aaron's sweater, I have this, which is a bag that I've offered in the past, a print that I've offered in the past, it was very popular. And I have one of these and I really love it. So I decided to do some more for this update. So it's this cute winter, look at the coffee, look at the hot cocoa slash coffee pot. Oh, it's so cute. And this sweet little robin. So cute. And then lastly, speaking of cute robins, but not little, there's the sky. So more birds and mushrooms. I'm pretty predictable, y'all. <laughs> Occasionally I buy fabrics that I don't love, but then they don't do as well. I don't know. Birds and mushrooms. Right. So this is this one is a denim, and this one also is the canvas. Again, um, I do like the denim for the larger bags because it's a little bit more rigid, but because of the black, it tends to, the canvas tends to take that black dye a bit better. So I go with the canvas on that one as well. Yay! So again, that update will be Friday, November 1st at 9 p.m. Eastern. And kitty cats and house coats. There's debate, is it a house coat? Is it a house dress? Is that her, just her trench coat? I'm just gonna go with house coat because it sounds fun. She is wearing her boots, but you know, you can wear your boots in your house. Maybe she's an agricultural kitty. She's just like, no, I'm not gonna take these boots on and off a million times today. I'm just gonna leave them on. This will be your house coat. So, um, yeah, so next time I'll show you my blocked sweater. I don't know, I'm, I don't, I'm deciding whether I should do my bonus episode about the, my sweater, or if I should do it about a few games that we've been enjoying this fall, because we're getting close to gift times and hall and families trapped in the same house times, and maybe that's a good thing to talk about. Either way, that'll be coming out in a few days. And I'll talk to you next time. Bye!